We're talking about energy today, Energy 808, the cutting edge, with Guillermo Sabatier, who joins us from, where are you, Guillermo, in Florida, was it? I am in Coral Springs, Florida, which is uh, just in, uh, just west of Fort Lauderdale. Ah, good, okay. South Florida. Um, South you're Florida. an energy man. You have a career in energy. Tell me about your career so I can try to get your job, you know? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's uh we definitely need the help. So uh, I am an electrical engineer. I, I've, I've been in the industry for 29, well, 30 years now. I um, spent most of that time working for Florida Power and Light, which is a subsidiary of Next Era Energy. Oh, we sure know that name here in Hawaii. Eh? Yeah, we know. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, had a, I had a hand in supporting some of the folks that were a great bunch of folks that were busy uh, doing that project during the they try to do the acquisition so a lot of great people working on that project i mean you know, we all have our regrets that it didn't work out but uh, we can talk some more about that later but yeah spent 29 years with them uh, electrical engineers spent a lot of that in system operations and uh, did worked almost at every point at the utility because it was a vertically integrated utility so i worked all the way from meter reading all the way up to system operations and even the nuclear plants so quite a bit of experience. Um, towards the very end, though, I did a lot of uh, regulatory compliance and also training of, uh, of uh, the personnel. And then I went to work for, for uh, had a great opportunity to go work for SOS International at the time, which is one of our training uh, support uh, providers. And then uh, SOS became HSI. Now we're part of the greater HSI organization and uh, our group is called uh, Industrial Skills. So, and then what we do, so, and, yep. go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, what we do is it provide uh, training uh, services for the electric utility industry, not just in operations, but pretty much anything from utility to health and safety to tracking OSHA and even doing some of the regulatory compliance uh, consulting and quite a whole lot of host of, uh, of um, support roles that we can do for them. So, so you're part of your, you're a part of, um, uh, HSI. What is HSI? How big is it? What does it do in general as a corporation? Well, HSI is the Health and Safety Institute, and, and uh, they they operate uh, globally. They um, they have a large number of different uh, subsidiaries or, or family of companies. Uh, they're about uh, close to like 500 employees, but what they do mostly is um, they provide a lot of like uh, OSHA health related training. They train first responders. They do, uh, there's a number of companies in there, like Battle, for example, where they do um, OSHA compliance tracking. The one I'm really familiar with in, in my realm is, is uh, the industrial skills, where we focus more on the training utility personnel and also industrial, uh, any kind of industry that we can think of that requires safety or operating heavy equipment, that sort of thing, we have our hand in that. So mm -hmm. my particular expertise though is in electric utility, NERC regulation and system operations for training personnel. So that's- Okay, really let, me, let me get some of that, uh, ex you know, um, defined. Sure, uh, sure. When you say compliance, what do you mean? Compliance with what? Regula uh, regulatory uh, re you know, requirements? Yes, well, in, in the mainland, the U.S. and Canada, uh, we are all subject to NERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and they, they, they are acting on behalf of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, right? Now, in Hawaii, you may not be subject to the same standards or, or, or requirements that the rest of the mainland is, and, and the main purpose of those requirements is to maintain reliability. Right. And uh, a lot of those standards have evolved in response to different disturbances, meaning blackouts. Uh, the really big one was back in 2003 in the Northeast. And then we've had a few other disturbances since then. And the standards and policies you know, evolve uh, through time, given you know, the different challenges that happen. Uh, one of the new ones that we're seeing now is, is they're, they're perhaps putting in some new standards in reaction to what happened in Texas last year, right, with the whole supply shortfall and that sort of, and that sort of thing. So there's another one coming up that may have to do with uh, distributed energy resources. So we'll talk some more of that in the discussion today, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, you know, Puerto Rico. And Texas, too, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so these standards would be calculated and um, promulgated to 
prevent those kinds of disasters, right? Absolutely. Um, and that's a, those are federal agencies, FERC and NERC, right. um, and they and they are really federal agencies, part of what the Department of Energy, I suppose. Right. Right. Um, so, how much power do they have? That's a that's a play on words, actually, Guillermo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's um, the uh, NERC is is the one that does enforcement, right? And they they act on behalf of FERC. And the way that works, NERC it, it is really it's it, it's by the member companies, right? And and every company has a hand in, in developing these standards, but. Uh, the regions, which are made up of the utilities, but the regions themselves uh, will run an audit. Uh, and when I talk about compliance, uh, basically is there's over like 275 requirements in these in these standards, right? Now, just to make something, you know, like stand out is if you have a violation in some of these standards, some of these requirements, you can get as much as a $1 million per infraction per day. So if you have an ongoing problem that isn't addressed for you know for a period of time, you know that could be some you know significant fine. Now you know those fines don't happen often. Uh, the industry has gotten pretty good about you know maintaining compliance, showing evidence. You know, hey, uh, this is what I do, but here's evidence showing that I do what I say I do. And and then the audits usually happen every three years. In other places, they happen almost every eighteen months. And mm -hmm. It's gotten to be a pretty, pretty fluid process, right? When it comes to they announce an audit's coming, you prepare and you get all your evidence ready, and and, and that, that's already at the point of an audit. But you know, every the operations, you just full, you just shape your entire operation is to make sure that you're operating within that compliance parameter. So, so it but, must be changing, though. I mean, for example, the two examples I mentioned: Puerto Rico and Texas. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, bad storm. Uh, to my, in my mind, maybe in the minds of some of the climate scientists, that's a, a climate change storm. And what happened, what happened in Texas, the same thing. You could connect that easily mm -hmm. with climate change and the weather and all. Um, so NERC must be interested and FERC must be interested in, in being as dynamic as the environment. In other words, if I have a greater risk of extreme weather, if I have a greater risk because of environmental changes, I have to change my standards to avoid the kinds of things that happen. Am I right? Right, and they 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 usually change uh, to, in the best case, they change in anticipation of what's coming. Sometimes they change as a reaction to. Uh, it's not always quick, and there's always like a a process where there's voting by the utilities. Now, ultimately, it is the utilities' best interest. Is the utilities themselves that come up with a lot of these requirements and standards. That's why they have the standards drafting teams but in the end it, it, it it's a lengthy process and and it's not always as 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 um as quick as we you know we want it to be but that's also not a bug as a feature because it's sometimes it takes a lot of time to gear up and get ready to be able to meet those new requirements um fortunately there there's a lot of there's a lot of you know smart folks a lot, a lot smarter than i am looking ahead and figuring out what what's coming up next and you know how to write standards and how to prepare for those standards so. So HSI, as part of its mission, would go to its um, uh, utility clients. I guess it's a clientele, a client arrangement, and, right. and say, look, here's some advice for you. Uh, you better be careful about this, that, and the other thing. You better right. you know, comply with these standards right. or else you'll get fined or who knows what. Right. Um, and, and so um, that's pretty valuable to utility. Uh, what happens if they don't take your advice, though, Guillermo? Well, that that's that's usually. I'm going to give a few examples, right? Of course, without naming names, but we've had utilities that that have asked, hey, from the very beginning, just help us come up with this with this with this program, and we've helped them develop the program from scratch, and the, and then really it's us running the program for them, uh, the compliance program, and they've been pretty successful. We've had other utilities where they've had uh, turnover, personnel retire, they don't replace them right away, and then they've had a gap. And they've come to us all, not at the last minute, but but we're not with a lot of time left to to prepare because they've had an audit coming, and and we've managed to help them, and and we've had a pretty good successful track record. But the the challenges are always different, right? Some of them give give you enough time, others come at you with a pretty bad emergency, and you, know, you do you do your best to help them, and and that you know luckily we we've done a good job about that. But yeah, it's it's always it's always. Um, Usually, it's uh, staff augmentation is what we're providing a lot of times, mm -hmm. and yeah. 
The majority of our subject matter experts are you know, have been in the utility industry already in that capacity. So we bring that knowledge here and help them out. Yeah, like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk. Let's shift a little bit to uh, safety and training. Um, seems to me that um, you know if you are handling heavy equipment. Uh, equipment which has fuel involved of some kind, mm -hmm. um, equipment that handles a lot of electrical energy. Right. Uh, these this danger in all sides of that. Absolutely. Moving it and operating it and connecting it and so forth. Um, so how do you make it safe and what do you focus on in the training you give them for mm, operating it and and, uh, and achieving some level of safety? Well, that, that's a that's a, a very important point. Um, when it comes to industrial skills, an example is uh, personnel that operate a refinery or personnel that operate a power generating facility, right? But there's a lot of that training begins to happen online, uh, self-paced. And then w once we get back from this whole COVID situation, we'll have more of the in-person training, but we've been very fortunate where we have a lot of like initial training for new personnel to get them at least going in that particular aspect of their, of their career or their job function, where they're at least familiar with the equipment, the dangers and how they operate. Uh, in my particular side, uh, you, safe safe handling of equipment in a substation for example we have a few training modules that deal into that and a lot of the basic issues of, for example stored energy right like don't stick your hand somewhere where there's like you know a charged spring or compressed gas a sort of thing that, that would be just one example of many that we have um and and, and you know usually the delivery medium is is, is evolving and it's changing and, and and we looked at the possibility of um coming into the whole virtual reality realm of being able to deliver training in that way, where you never even have to set foot in a, in a facility or a substation and, and, and you get to avoid that risk altogether. But that's still the development stages, you know, but, but we'll all be there eventually. So. Well, you talk about, um, you know, virtual reality or virtual in general. And um, I would imagine in the past two, now going on three years, mm -hmm. a lot of the training you would, HSI uh, would offer uh, would be virtual, would be on uh, Zoom and the like. Uh, am I right? It, it's not there yet. We're, we're, we're starting to look into that and to develop that. Uh, we'd like to get there one day. Uh, there, there's still a lot of material needs to be developed, and then the, the the initial upfront effort and cost is significant. But but yeah, that that's something that we'd like to do at some point. So. Yeah. And this again is for clientele, and the clientele could be in the U.S. It could be in North America. Um, it, I, I suppose it could be anywhere, and, I, and I'm thinking of some of the um, utility installations in developing countries must be well below the standard of safety that you would like to see. Um, you know, they may have a different approach to safety and, and training. How do you how do you handle a situation um, where you know this is a country, for example, where the utility is really rough at the edges? Uh, how do you make that safe? Well, that that. A lot of times is it has to be up to them to approach you uh, and them wanting to actually take that kind of advice and that kind of guidance and, and invest in that kind of training. I mean, you can't really force them to do anything, you know, whenever it's outside of this nation. But but I, it's it's ideally you would hope that that would they would approach and and and, and invest in that kind of training for their for, for their personnel. It's not always the case, but. Um, so far, we've had a pretty good track record of, of being able to present that that particular case, and they go ahead and invest and get that training. And we've had quite a few countries that that have uh, taken advantage of that, and, and and their overall operations have improved because of that training, safety training. Yeah, and the training has to follow the technology. I mean, so if you look twenty or thirty years ago, that was one kind of technology, and in many cases, the technology was delivered to the hinterland. Um, you know, on mm -hmm. on. Uh, barges and 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 the like, <laughs> and uh, who knows how long it would last or how whether it was being maintained and so forth. But now the technology is electronic. The technology has right. built-in safeguards. The technology is is um, as you say, uh, virtual in many cases. And so, um, if you're going to train somebody, it's, it's sort of like the military. If you're going to train somebody, you have to you have to train them on the latest equipment. That right. means you have to follow the latest equipment wherever mm -hmm. it is made or deployed. How do you keep up? That is, that is uh, a, a lot of fresh SMEs and uh, always staying in touch and up to speed with the changes of technology. Uh, luckily for us, we, we stay in contact with 
a lot of folks in the uh, in the industry. And uh, of course, you know, like anybody else, attend the shows, attend the uh, the white papers, publish. You read the published papers, and just you know, work with manufacturers, right, and what they're doing. And that usually, you know, keeps you pretty current with what's happening in the industry. Mm. Um, but you know, there and our, our material, we're you know, we're constantly inspecting it and kind of trying to keep it up, you know, up to date and and updating it or changing certain things about it that no longer apply, right, and. Especially with when we, we see images in some in some cases that are pretty old, so we will go ahead and change those. And you know, the yeah, science be thing. recommending changes to the utility. I suppose say, look, if you want to be safe, you can't use this kind of thing anymore. You right. have to move on. You know? Well, there there are definitely changes that that uh, a, a lot of that is driven by OSHA, and and you see a lot of that happening. I triple E is another one. Uh, and then you know, the utilities themselves, at least here in the US and Canada, are pretty good about staying up to date with uh, safety practices. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of that is the IBW uh, as well is uh, greatly involved in that. So you have to stay in touch with them, read their pubs, mm -hmm. uh, see what they're working on and where, where they are warning you. Then you can, in turn, warn your, your clients. Right. Now, when you talk about the equipment and all that, you're not just talking about generators and you know connection points and stations and substations. Um, you're talking about um, all the equipment for all kinds of uh, energy resources, I suppose, including wind turbines and solar and what have you, whatever, whatever works, uh, whatever is generating or um, distributing electricity, right? Yeah. That, that's a lot of stuff to keep track of, no? Mm, yeah, yeah. And it goes from the generator to the transmission system all the way down to the distribution and we even this, this, all the way down to the customer's meter and, and, and a, a lot of the different topics and areas of, of education and safety that are involved. So that's a lot of things to, to cover. Yeah, and it's changing. So that must be very interesting. And what what it leads that leads to my next in area of inquiry, Guillermo, mm -hmm. and and that is jobs. You know, there's so many people say, hey, this is a very mm, um, profitable area because there's so much money passing hands because so many people need energy and because of the uh, appliances we have and the electronics we use at the consumer level we need more and more energy all the time uh, there's more of a demand on on utilities uh, and other sources of energy and therefore lots and lots and lots of jobs and so the training you're talking about has to apply to the the newbies as well Right. Um, they right. have to be trained to get into it and, and be experienced on a rapid basis. Am I right? Absolutely. And, and just one example of the many things, uh, NERC itself, just for the operators of the bulk electric system, these system operators have to be certified. It's kind of like a license, right? And and just to get that certification, it, it's it's usually a pretty big intimidating exam. So we provide the test preparation training, which is online, and then the, we have the actual instructor-led training, and we provide a lot of support for a lot of these new operators. And 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 it's the one thing they need to be able to work on the system. We also provide some training for distribution operations personnel, right? So that is also gaining a little bit of popularity because now. It, it's um, NERC may, may be getting into that realm when it comes to regulation. So, so we're, you know, we're getting ready for that change as well. But then uh, that's just one example. There, there's other opportunities, right, for uh, just the, the, the trades, you know, working welders, working in the, in the um, industry, working in, 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 in power plants. Uh, that's just one example, line workers. I mean, there's a serious uh, gap in the amount of available line workers in this country, both distribution and transmission. And and it's interesting because like uh, like uh, a lot of the trades right now, they, they have a definite you know, personnel shortfall. So a lot of opportunities. I mean, if somebody doesn't really want to go to college, but they want to you know start working and earning some good money right away, that's that's a, a one option for them to actually look at. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, I, I took a tour of uh, the IBEW here mm -hmm. and uh, other other such unions, and they have programs to teach you energy, to make you competent in uh, right. installing, for example, solar energy, because there, right. there are dangers and it's, it's a need to understand. And I suppose that makes an electrical energy uh, degree all the more valuable. Oh, okay. I went to school like you did would be in great demand right now, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. And 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 I've 
it's not just that it, it's the it's the the very different opportunities that you have but just by understanding this industry and this science there's so many different opportunities from design to science and, and even and then not even getting into the business side of it right where you have all these different investments and 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 I myself have an MBA, so 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 you know I joined the dark side long ago, and <laughs> I looked at the business side of this of this industry, and and you know you ultimately see you know the costs and the operating dynamics of that sort of thing, and and even the the challenges that you're facing you know as the science changes, right? So so many yeah. different opportunities, right? That, that that we can look at, especially now, and we're we're at a great time where things are definitely changing. So. Well, let, let's talk about the MBA side of thing. You've been writing articles. What is the focus of your, you know, professional image uh, interest? And 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 what are the articles you've been writing about? What are you covering? What are you um, talking to the community about? Well, I've I've uh, talked a little bit about the opportunity of like meshing this new uh, technology where it's we, we've all seen peer to peer business, right? Where it's like Uber or or ride sharing or the gig economy, or you're selling things, you know, at the very granular level, but in, in massive quantities, right? Where it's like an example would be this peer to peer energy marketing, right? So as more and more people develop and they get into the whole producing their own energy, where it's solar panels or storage or batteries, or even their EVs, eventually we're going to get to the point where we can actually sell power at the distribution level to our neighbors, to our folks that are on the same feeder and the same substation and never getting into the, the transmission system. So ultimately that'll present the opportunities and also a lot of challenges for utilities, right? Um, part of that being, now you're gonna have power flowing in the opposite direction, right? From, from, from where you should be the uh, end consumer and now it's a producer or a prosumer. So that will change the way uh, the system behaves dynamically. But you know, it, given with, with with AI and the way we're developing our technology and our smart systems, you know, that can definitely be managed. And I see a lot of opportunities there. So some of my articles, you know, have to do with that. That's very exciting. I mean, I remember reading that in Texas back years ago, there was a a, 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 a law that was unique to Texas, where you could sell power to your neighbor across the street. Right. Uh, in other states, uh, the utility laws would not let you do that. They would require that you qualify uh, for the regulators as as a utility, which is not right. easy. <clears throat> so now this peer to peer thing could be a statement of the future. I suspect it is a statement of the future that we'll have everybody connected with everybody else, everybody distributing mm -hmm. to everyone else, all participating in this kind of mesh of, right. of uh, electrical energy. Uh, how do you see that unfolding? I mean, I see it unfolding over, over time. It's already being piloted in a, in a few regions. I mean, California is one of them. They're doing that in Europe as well. Uh, one of the big concerns is cybersecurity. As you can imagine, you know, the, uh, one big uh, dominant provider has an app and they manage to hack that. Then you, know, you can imagine how that can lead to certain reliability issues, right? Um, that That's one aspect of it. The other one really is... Um, from a utility standpoint, right? It, it's it's they can they could probably take advantage of that in the sense that now they've had to offset the need to build generation and transmission lines. So so you know they can help you throw up your system and run it and manage it, but at the same time you're, they're offsetting their 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 own generation cost. So there are opportunities there that depending on the utility and how they're structured. But um, again, there is going to be some regulatory hurdles, and and that's why FERC order twenty two twenty two which is coming into effect pretty soon, like in the next couple of months. Uh, what it really was for, was for the aggregators to, to give them a little bit more flexibility, meaning that they would compete in the open markets. So an aggregator would just buy all this power from these different little prosumers and aggregate it, and then go and bid and sell and buy in, in the open market. But and, uh, and that distributes the capital, the capital requirements. In other words, you can have a business right. somewhere right. in that mesh, and you can have a much smaller investment than a utility would make, Right, but you right. can make money. It can be uh, something where you you put some money in and you have you have a right. return on your investment and and a lot of people can do it and um, and control it. Uh, right. and it's just very exciting to me that this is possible. Well, and and at some point, uh, one thing that utilities have been working on a lot is not really capacity. They've been looking at dispatchability. So so though though they I see at one point they they will probably pay you money to just be available 
for dispatch and not really not really absorbing power or sending power back out, but just to be available. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they consider more importantly in some cases, right? Just to be ready to withstand the next contingency. And well, we we uh, we promised our viewers we would talk about uh, national and, mm -hmm. for that matter, international energy markets, and and we have oil going up nicely as anticipated again, um, and and we have gas uh, on the horizon, including this strange uh, set of circumstances. Uh, Around Ukraine and Gazprom and um, the pipeline, oh, yeah. um, Nord, Nord Stream, I think it is, uh, from Russia to Germany. Um, we have the U.S. trying to sell gas hither and yon, and including to Asia. Um, it's it's all changing. It seems like it's transforming in front of our eyes. Right. And, right. and how is this affecting the energy markets, energy prices? Uh, in the utilities and in the supply right now? Well, well, gas, natural gas has definitely gone up a little bit, you know, on the cost per, per million BTUs. Um, I never thought I'd see this, but but the, the fact that they're actually got compressing gas and tankers and they're shipping it overseas was something that I never thought I'd see, but yeah, here we are, you know. So the cost of gas over there has finally offset the cost of transporting it, which which is mind blowing, right? Yeah. And but we're finally here. And uh, the other thing too is is as we transition from fossil fuels or or anything else over to renewables, you can't run on renewables all the time, right? You you're you're going to need some dispatchability on that. And and um, a lot of that bridge fuel has become natural gas. And states like California, for example, where where they they've had very aggressive goals. They seems seems like to me they they walked it back a little bit. Uh, where the governor was declaring uh, natural gas once again the zero carbon fuel, which you know shows how how their their their, their expectation of what what's going on versus the reality and and um, not to mention the fact that they're 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 mothballing Diablo Canyon, which is their last uh, nuclear unit out there. Um, a, a lot of mixed opinions about that. I mean, uh, nuclear right, does, doesn't emit any, any, you know, no emissions, no carbon, but yeah, you have the weight. So, but, but the same you put nuclear together with uh, uh, cyber, cyber security issues, mm -hmm. it, it does make you worry. It makes you worry, but at the same time, it's, it's part of your supply and part of your portfolio and your ener energy mix. And if you get rid of it, you don't have anything to replace it with now you, you've got a shortfall so and then, then they ended up having to bring units back online that were that have been mothballed and some of those were a little dirty but so that's why now they're they're leaning more on natural gas again so so it's it's a good bridge fuel natural gas is a lot more demand for it now for that reason and it's just you know it's a shame that it's gotten so expensive yeah okay well last question is um um by the way, it's not my last question. I want to admit something. I've been thinking throughout this whole show that we have to have another show. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we absolutely. have to drill down on so many of the issues. We're just we're skipping the stone across the pond, and, and there's so many things we could talk about. So um, <laughs> but let me ask you about um, uh, let me ask you about renewables. You know, where do they fit in all of what we've been talking about? Are they succeeding? Uh, what's the political environment for them? Uh, what's the pressure of the climate change contingent? Uh, are, are we able, are we going to be able to make our goals such as they are? Are we going to be able to make some significant contribution to, you know, the, the global effort at dealing with climate change? I mean, we're definitely making some good, good, uh, good progress and good goals. Uh, the, the challenge is when we shoot too far ahead and we don't have the bridge fuels, right? We don't have the bridge generation. And what I mean by that is, is you cannot run your system on solar alone, right? I mean, I mean, you're good from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And, and before that and after that, what do you what do you do, right? And batteries can only give you enough energy for maybe a couple of hours. And most most utilities don't want to run them every day because they have a limited number of cycles. So so storage is important, right? Uh, when it comes to that sort of thing. So we're getting there eventually. Um, very clean burning of natural gas, uh, and for the for the good foreseeable future, uh, definitely getting away from coal. Definitely getting away from oil. Uh, I think Florida got rid of its last oil burning power plant. I mean, over a decade ago or longer than that. So, but uh, you know, a lot of the portfolio here is natural gas. But they do have a lot of solar and no wind, of course. And I, I give you one guess as to why. 
<laughs> no wind. No I... wind. Well, we, we have problems about wind too for many <laughs> reasons. Yeah, you anyway, get tight ones, right? We get hurricanes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can imagine what happens to a wind turbine in a hurricane. Yeah. Never mind. Uh, yeah, bad investment. <laughs> yeah, right. So. Uh, uh, okay, Guillermo, we're out of time. I, I, oh. I have to say, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I want okay. to come back and we'll set up another show or shows uh, to deal with some of these issues and some of the changes that we are going to find going forward. Uh, this is a very important topic. It's an, important for the economy in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. and it's important for the future of the country in a number of ways. Absolutely. And I envy you being so close to the center of it, uh, having you know, uh, having all these um, all these areas of expertise. Thank you, thank you so much, Guillermo. Well, thank you for having me. And and I, next time, I really look forward to talking more about Hawaii because I really, really want to bring that up again because it's a it, it was something that that, that that i was really enthusiastic about when they were looking at the at back in my day and next era and uh i would like to see one day you know that they you guys make that uh renewable goal at some point yes sir absolutely yes okay we'll be back guillermo sabatier hsi.com thanks very much Aloha. thank you jay Aloha.